Interesting though it may be to talk about the history of Gothic as exemplified in the Basilica of Saint-Denis, the history side of Gothic architecture is a lot less interesting than the engineering side of it, I believe. Gothic is a style of arches, more so than any architectural style before or since. As such, I'm going to briefly elaborate on a few different types of arch. Broadly speaking, there are two types of arch, and no, for probably the only time in this series, I'm not talking about pointed arches and round arches. I'm going a little deeper than that to voussoir arches, also known as true arches, and corbel arches. Voussoir arches and corbel arches can look almost identical, but are constructed in completely different ways. A true arch is made with stones called voussoirs, which follow the curve of the arch, and need to be built with the aid of a temporary support structure, usually made of wood, that's called the centering. Trying to build a voussoir arch without using centering all but guarantees it will collapse during construction. In contrast, a corbel arch is made with regular stones placed on top of one another, with each stone providing the support for the next one up. This is also how the corbel arch gets its name, because in architecture a corbel is a piece of stone or brick that sticks out from its base and provides support for walls, roofs or other features on top, effectively acting like a cantilever. Like any cantilever, a corbel requires enough load on its base to stop it and whatever was built on top of it from collapsing. Corbel arches don't require centering when properly built, however, which is a major advantage. A major disadvantage is that they're not nearly as structurally efficient as voussoir arches, because there are no stones placed perpendicular to the direction of the load, meaning the horizontal load isn't transformed into vertical load as effectively. Now, I went on to a tangent about corbel arches partly because of an entirely correct comment somebody made on an earlier video, partly to show how far Europe and the Middle East were already ahead of most other parts of the world even prior to Gothic, but mostly because it's important to bear in mind that corbel arches of a pointed nature do exist, and while I do think it's fair to refer to these as pointed arches, you ought to bear in mind they're not the same as pointed voussoir arches. On two pointed voussoir arches and the backbone of Gothic architecture. As I mentioned, the stone in voussoir arches are perpendicular to the curve of the arch, and the forces in the arch will follow roughly the same curve. Any structural engineers watching, please note the word roughly before you comment. For all non-engineers watching, I'd like you to do an experiment for me. Feel free to pause the video while you do it. Grab a piece of flexible string, hold it loosely with a hand on either end, and see which shape the string naturally takes. Congratulations, you've just repeated one of the most famous experiments in architecture history. Well, on a smaller scale, anyway. This particular experiment was done by the famed architect Antoni Gaudi, and what he found is something engineers had suspected for a long time, that the most efficient arch is the exact inverse of the shape the string took, the catenary arch. If I put a round arch and an equilateral pointed arch onto the catenary arch, I think I've just created a picture that says more than a thousand words, because the pointed arch clearly approximates the catenary arch a lot closer, and remember, the catenary arch is the ideal arch. For the sake of completeness, I also mentioned that parabolic arches that very closely approximate a catenary arch were used in antiquity, famously in the city gate of Ashkelon and the Sassanid imperial palace at Tessiphon, and it's the latter that clearly shows the sheer span that can be achieved with such arches. Why didn't these arches continue to be used? I truthfully couldn't tell you. My best guess is that people didn't like the aesthetics, but that's no more than a hunch. Anyway, that, in a nutshell, is why the pointed arch works so well. It's far closer to the ideal arch than the round arch is. There was one other type of arch occasionally used in Gothic that I need to mention, and that's the segmental arch. Segmental arches are rubbish at redirecting their load downwards, and so they were almost exclusively used in situations where that wasn't a requirement. A segmental arch is just a segment of a full arch, as the name suggests, and theoretically this can be done with any arch, so a segmental pointed arch is perfectly possible. It seems this wasn't done very often though, and for good reason. There's no point in going to the added complexity of a pointed arch if you're going to almost completely negate its greatest strength anyway. Common uses for segmental arches are in windows, where there's plenty of abutments on either side, and in machiculations, yes I know, where one segmental arch can push into the one next to it, the sideways forces cancelling each other out. On to flying buttresses. The flying buttress works just like a regular buttress, so no grand reveals there. Using an arch to transfer forces from one location to another was of course well established, and it's no great leap to apply this idea to a buttress. The interesting thing about the flying buttress when it comes to structure is not how it works, but what it allows for. Using a flying buttress allows you to extend the downward forces almost as far from the wall as you like, foregoing the requirement for thick internal walls or columns, which is a quality often exploited in Gothic buildings. Rib folds and groin folds basically work the same structurally, with rib folds simply being more tolerant of complex intersections of arches. The problem with rib folds is that a chain is only ever as strong as its weakest link, and the weakest links of a rib fold are its diagonal ribs. A rib fold made of intersecting equilateral pointed arches and that doesn't have a raised centre will have diagonal ribs that form a much flatter and therefore less efficient arch, requiring either thicker columns to hold the fold up or pointier arches to begin with. 
Mind you, this issue is shared with Groinvolts. Any problems these vaults have is completely offset by their advantages though, the main one of which is that they completely remove the requirement for structural walls. Because the downwards forces of a rib or groin vault are always redirected to a series of points, rather than a line as in a barrel vault or a circle as in a dome, the space between these points can be filled with whatever you might want. You can fill it with non-structural walls, or you can be designing a cathedral and fill it with massive windows depicting biblical scenes. Now there are plenty of instances in gothic buildings where, say, a rib vault was used where a barrel vault would suffice, or a flying buttress where it needn't have been flying. Why was this done? Because Gothic architecture, while making use of great structural innovations, was not just about engineering, it was art as well. You'll hear more about that in part 3. If you like this video feel free to subscribe to Robert Explains and if you hated it feel equally free to spew vitriol at your leisure. Until next time.